this is our Mandala Zoom event and we are so excited that you guys can join us. We've got Angela, our chairperson here today, going to share and then we've got um, Elaine Fraser, um, our guest speaker. And um, so without further, further ado, um, get your pens ready, get your papers ready, make some notes. And um, at the end of our Zoom, we will have a Q&A for you. So please jot down your questions in the chat um, and we'll get to those at the end. So, um, oh, someone says we've got bad weather. Um, we will record this, so um, we'll make it available for you at the end um, if you've got some troubles with your internet. But all good. Um, I am now going to hand over to um, to our chairperson, Angela, and um, she'll be she'll be doing a welcome to country, and then we'll get straight into it. Thanks, Mandy, and it's really good to be able to know that there are people from Tasmania and Brisbane and Melbourne and um, around Perth and other places who are joining us today. So the first thing that I'd like to do is acknowledge that we're coming to you today from Wadjuk country. So I would like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging and uh, know that we are very grateful for the care of which they have given to this country. So for me to begin, the question is about what's um, the difference between a symbol and a metaphor. Can we have the, thanks. <laughs> it's easy enough to become confused with lots of these different kinds of words. And all of us have had some sort of English training. And of course, the, our, our English uh, education would have talked about similes, would have talked about metaphors, would have talked about all kinds of things. Uh, but when we start talking in the creative arts, it's really good to be able to separate them and know what it is that uh, we're talking about. So if you go to the Merriam-Webster dictionary or most other major dictionaries, metaphor is a figure of speech um, in which a word or phrase literally denoting one kind of object or idea is used in place of another to suggest a likeness or an analogy between them, such as drowning in money. So it's figurative language. So in visual art, it becomes something also that it's a figurative language within the art. Um, and of course, it's very, very powerful. The one, one thing I was thinking about this morning um, is there are commonly used words in our um, language, our, our normal language, and um, one of them would be, uh, she carries the world on her shoulders. That's a metaphor. And that metaphor literally denotes that one thing that that person is doing. So she is carrying the world on her shoulders. That means that she is um, taking on board uh, way too much, a vast amount. So if we go to the um, next slide, thanks. It comes from the Greek word metaphorine, which means to transfer, so to carry across. So a metaphor is says something that is being used in place of something. Therefore, the really important notion here is that a metaphor has a single reference. So when you talk about she carries the world on her shoulders, that is a single reference to a single attitude and a single way of being. And if we have a look at the next slide, Emily Dickinson's poem, which some of you will be familiar with, The Railway Train. And it only mentions the train in the title, but the poem uses the metaphor of an iron horse to describe the train. So throughout the four stanzas of the poetry, there's this beautiful understanding of this extraordinary iron thing that um, whips through the countryside at great speed. But when you get to the final stanza, you understand what this metal thing is that she's referring to. Even though the term iron horse is not used, the term railway train is not used within the poem, but her description is very powerful because she uses that metaphor. And the final stanza, and nay, like Boanerges, then punctual as a star, stop, docile and omnipotent, 
at its own stable door. Even the use of the words docile and omnipotent in the same line are incredibly um, strong because they are so varied, they are so different, those two words. So if we just come to the next slide then, other metaphors that you would be familiar with in our own, uh, <laughs> our own world, my day job is, bread and, is my bread and butter, but my art is chicken soup for the soul. So there's two metaphors, one about the earnings and the other about what's really important. Time flies, that's another one. He's a real teddy bear. Money laundering. Laughter is the next uh, is the best medicine. These are things where the, the idea is transferred into something that isn't possible or isn't likely, but because we know that other thing, it gives a great richness. So the meaning is transferred onto a word or a visual image, and therein lies the power. So calling somebody a real teddy bear means um, it's, that that person is really cuddly, that that person has great warmth, that that person is comforting, um, that that person brings you great joy. So the use of metaphor, of course, becomes very powerful. And on to the next. If we, when we move to symbol, though, we're moving to something that has a much greater richness. The origin of the word comes from the Greek symbolon, which means a contract or a token. And um, in uh, ancient Greece, one of the things that would happen is if you sent a message uh, from one uh, leader to another, from one king to another king, or uh, to certainly somebody of power, you could break in half um, a particular object that had markings on it. And then that would indicate to when the people got together that this was an insignia that was identifying and that this message had been um, spread, had been given. On the right of the slide there, you've got the example of the traditional position symbol of a staff intertwined by a snake. That actually comes from the book of Numbers in the Bible in the Old Testament, where we hear uh, that there's this terrible situation where all of the serpents are are invading the camp and people are dying. So God commanded Moses to make a serpent and to lift it up on a pole so that anyone bitten by the serpents could look at the serpent on the pole and live rather than die. This particular symbol is still used today. It has been used for a very long time. Um, and it indicates that that person who uses that symbol, who has that symbol, is somebody who will save lives. So symbols become intermediaries that help us access the sacred and our spiritual realms. For Christians, perhaps the most powerful symbol is the, the Eucharist. It's an example of a very highly developed form of a complex symbolic action. So it involves symbolic actions, gestures, words, interpretive words, pictorial representations, and all of these things help us to approach the divine. So it's a very, very complex thing, but it's not something that can be um, in isolation. In order for people to understand the symbols, to grow with the symbols, to work with the symbols, they have to be initiated into that. So the initiation into symbols becomes really important. They're symbols are actions that disclose relationships. Just looking at the rows, uh, a red rose like that may mean an awful lot of things to different people because we have a sense of participation. We have a sense of memory within that. So a red rose given to somebody on February the 14th has a very, very um, real declared meaning. It means I love you. If it's given in some other context, its meaning may well be very different. So symbols invite us into relationship, invite us into a way in which we can understand the relationship and understand the context better. We're required sometimes, just go back a bit, yeah, we're required to fill in the blanks. So instead of it being just one simple idea that is being transferred as in a metaphor, we are filling in the blanks to a whole range of ideas. So it demands that we participate in this action. 
So the symbols are communicating meaning that are beyond surface level. They remind us of what we already know and they tell us of things that we do not fully know. Seeing the cross on the side of the road, the white cross. If you're Christian, you'll understand that the white nature of that means that it is um, a sign of resurrection, that once somebody has died, we understand as Christians that resurrection follows because of the goodness of God. The flowers that are gathered around that white cross symbolise the intensity with which people remember that person who's died in a road accident. In other states, not in WA, but in other states, they used to have red crosses as well to indicate people who had been seriously injured, whose blood had been shed in a car accident but had survived. Um, they don't I understand that doesn't happen anymore. But symbols, therefore, have to, we make us use our imagination. So we have to be imaginative to be able to enter into that. And they have always more than one dimension, more than one meaning, unlike metaphor. So a bit like a location joke, work jokes, you know, things that work is because people understand the context. And the next one, thank you. Living symbols are really difficult to pin down because the meaning is not restricted to one thing alone. And within Christian art, um, over the last 1,700 years where we have been tracing Christian art, there are meanings that have developed. Uh, one such thing is the fish. The, the word um, for the, the fish, the Greek word, the, the letters of that mean Jesus Christ, son of God, saviour. So if um, in the ancient world people saw that, if Christians saw that, they would know and understand that that was a symbol um, that indicated that there were Christian people nearby. So with language as well, whether it's visual language um, or our spoken language, it is essentially symbolic and it relies on memory. That's why it's really hard to try and introduce whether it is in language or whether it is in um, a visual sense. It's very hard to try and introduce a symbol that has no previous use. Um, there are so many symbols that we can use, but we really need to be able to have the viewer or the listener understand it. They need to speak commonly to all of us and speak distinctively to each of us. Consider this symbol. If you saw that symbol, just that candle, just simply in a room, it could be there to. Uh, give light, uh, particularly in times prior to electricity, or it could be in order to embrace the darkness in a very, very gentle way, or it might be because it's a smelly candle and you really want some aromatherapy. Um, if there's a whole gathering of candles placed in a particular place, we will understand that this is something that is um, being done in memory of somebody who has died. Uh, those of you who are old enough will probably remember the extraordinary um, gathering of candles and flowers when Princess Diana died, how um, it was overwhelming the number of people who came to do that. And then of course, at her funeral, um, the, the beautiful song, Candle in the Wind, this whole sense of light. Now, if you're Christian, the use of the candle very much refers to Christ as being the light of the world. And there's more to it than that. It's not just the way that Christians use candles in ritual, or it's not just the fact of a candle, but it's also the way in which the, the candle burns down. Um, that's why I really don't like these oil candles that they use these days, because you can't see that the candle actually diminishes in order to give light. So there is a sense of sacrifice. There's part of the candle that indicates that to us. Um, my presentation here is really quite brief and certainly there's lots and lots more that we could do about symbols. And if you'd like to see that happen, then I'm sure we can do that at a later time. But what I'd like you to consider is that profound difference between metaphor and symbol. Metaphor transfers one idea. Symbol can transfer 
a most extraordinary array of ideas, particularly when it relies on um, memory, when it relies on context, when it relies on a, a, a cultural context that wraps itself around that. Uh, there's also lots of materials that are available um, that are around this subject. And, and if in the future uh, people want that developed further, we can certainly do that. But right now I'd like to introduce Elaine. Um, Elaine Fraser is, a, is um, an author and works full time in writing and teaching. And so Elaine, you are very welcome and we're very pleased that you could join us today so that we could um, have this webinar. Hi everyone and thank you Angela for that lovely um, explanation. I used to teach English and I think that your explanation was very clear and uh, very helpful and I think um, when you're talking about your art and that's what we're going to be talking about when we start discussing bios and uh, artist statements. Um, knowing those distinctions, I imagine, is very important and also very helpful uh, for people. So as you keep those ideas in mind about simile, um, it's not similes, metaphor and um, symbolism, perhaps we can move on to now to thinking about how you actually describe your art and also how you describe yourself as an artist. Um, I presume that a lot of you will be thinking about entering the, uh, the Art Award. And as you can see in the, um, in the actual description of the entry, you have to actually write a bio and an artist statement using only 500 characters, including spaces. Now, writing about art is very difficult to explain your art to someone else is actually a skill in itself and I think most of us as, even as a writer if I'm asked to write a blurb or a synopsis that's often harder for me than writing 50 or 100,000 words in a book um, actually distilling things down is actually much harder so I think uh, when you think of your artist uh, bio and statement, I think if you keep in mind you're writing a story basically, you're writing a story about your life as an artist and your work, your, either the piece that you're entering into the competition or your work generally if you're writing a longer artist statement. So they're worth doing well, they're worth keeping uh, practicing and keep updating and keep working on them until you get them right because you will use it over and over again in the writing world we talk about giving an elevator pitch and I imagine it's the same in the artist's world where you are asked to come in perhaps to to a gallery or whatever and say well what's your art about and why should I show your art or whatever and you give a, a one or two minute pricey of your art and your art life and it might um, eventually appear in a catalogue or it might be on social media so distilling it down to what we call the elevator pitch is a very important thing so what are the differences between a bio and an artist statement so a bio or a biography is a personal statement about you and in this context you as an artist and an art statement is about your art practice. And if you're applying for the art award, then you have to describe your piece of art in a very short amount of time. And also give an indication of what your art is about generally. So your professional artist bio is basically a personal uh, resume in paragraph form and written in third person. And a bio explains who you are as an artist. And it should include some information about you and how you got started. And um, it's important to uh, they know the difference between those two. Um, the art statement is more about your art practice, the mediums you use and the ideas that you want to write about your, um, and as Angela was talking about, maybe your key metaphors or your symbolism they might come into play there so 
it's much easier, I think, to write, for me, I don't know about you, to write a 500-word essay than it is to distill your life and work down into 500 characters. Today, I'm going to give you an overview of both how to write a longer bio and artist statement and how to start with a longer version and then distill it down and into a shorter version. So we're going to you can look at different contexts for your bio or artist statement, but also relating it specifically to this particular award that we're discussing today. So what is included in your statement? Um, it should always be written in the third person. Now, all these notes, by the way, will be sent to you. So please, if you don't want to, you don't have to try and write everything down. They will be sent to you and all the points, uh, you know, can be explained further if you've got questions later on. We're only really skimming through this, but you will be provided all these points and information um, after the talk. And so what's included? Where were you born? Where did you live after that? If it's important to your art, of course, it, you know, um, don't just give a list of every single place that you live. Where are you currently based? What has been your art? artistic inspiration and why your favorite medium unique techniques and all the general things there in that list but a question I'd like to ask you is what is your brand or persona as an artist and I think these things are good to think about before you even start writing so these are not in the 500 character version these are not things that are all going to be written about but I think it's very important to actually think about all these things, write your answers to them. And then if you ever have an interview or do a podcast or what have you, you'll have all this information already distilled and written down. Um, but who are you as an artist? Uh, what is important to you as a person and as an artist? Is there something unusual, interesting or quirky to make you stand out? And think about some of those key words that you would describe, use to describe yourself. Um, and I think you need to explore a lot of these things before you actually write your bio. There's other, other questions that you could do. You know, where do you actually practice? Are you in a studio? Do you share a studio? Do you, um, you know, do you have a professional place that you work or do you work in a shed in the back garden or whatever it is? Think about your message and your motivation, your age and identity. Do you teach or do other work? What are some of the issues or subjects that are close to your heart? Do you have links to a certain particular landscape or country? What's your cultural background? What study have you um, participated in? Perhaps you've had the opportunity to participate in press and um, podcasts as I mentioned before and you can actually um, I would suggest that you sometimes when you speak in a podcast or an interview you say something gold and when you listen to it back to it go oh that was a really good statement mine your interviews and podcasts and things where you've spoken for comments that you've made and um actually write those down and keep them because they might may become part of your bio uh, statement later on um, you know ask yourself what, what keeps you coming back to the studio day after day uh, a, a really good question is you know what um, is there something that someone has said about your work that has really resonated with you and resonated with others about your work Sometimes people write in guest books at exhibitions or maybe on social media, they've written comments about your work. Actually mind some of these things and think about how people view your work because when you're creating your work, you're not um, just creating it for yourself, of course. You're creating it for an audience, for people to, to enjoy and view or to be challenged by or uh, to be inspired by. So ask yourself all these questions. Um, you know, who is your art for? What are the subjects that drive the work or speak into your themes? You know, is there a 
political or cultural or technological climate which you're working in. All these things are amazing that you can just write down and think about because who are you as an artist? You could write pages and pages and some of you I'm sure could write books about your artistic life or your artistic work. Once you've answered all these questions and you've written down as much as you can about yourself and a bit about your work, I would suggest that you actually print it out, get a highlighter, and then actually use a highlighter to go through and highlight the key words in that, uh, all your answers that you've run. Because you need to edit it down. So say if you've written on the above questions, if you've written one or two sentences on each and you've got a quote that you've written from yourself or comments that other people have made about your work. So if you've written and answered all these questions before you've written your bio, you might have two or three pages of stuff written down. Now, how do you edit that down? For some contexts, for, for example, on your blog, you might have 300 words or 400 words for your bio. Then you might have a catalogue and you might have 200 words or 120 words to actually include in the catalogue or for this art price, for example, Mandela art price, you might have to then um, actually break it, put it down again. It sounds like I'm breaking up a bit. I'm sorry. I can't really see any um, signal problems on this end, but I'm sorry if I'm breaking up a bit. How do you edit this down? What you include and exclude becomes a very important process. So use a highlighter pen and distill it down. Now there's a suggested framework on one of the slides if you'd like to um, click to that one. The suggested framework for a bio, maybe where it's got paragraph one, paragraph two, keep going so what do you actually write how long have you been making art what mediums do you work with yep go back just go back to the previous that's it yep that's it thank you um you know where are you based what's your formal training how did you to make art what do you achieve aim to achieve in your art Etc. If you've got those three paragraphs there, you're making it shorter again. So you can see how you've gone from pages of stuff. Because how, did, how does a person summarize their whole life as an artist into these 500 characters? Well, you start with the longer version, then you trim it down even further into these three paragraphs. Then you have to distill it down even further. So let's go to the next one. So you need to go and make a highlight reel. Your bio is not the whole book. It's only the blurb. It's not the whole movie. It's only the trailer. It's the highlight reel. If you think about the Twitterverse and how you only have so many characters to write, you're really writing a Twitter version of your bio. <laughs> so you really have to work hard to get it down. So you can't be waffly. You can't be too many, use too many words. You need to distill it down. Now we do have a few examples um, as we go on to the next slide. Um, There's a simple sentence there down the bottom there. It's just a standard stock standard sentence. But you might like to try something a little bit more um, specific as well. Um, something a bit more quirky, something a little bit more interesting if you've got something like that about yourself. But the safe way is just to have a straightforward sentence. That, you know, um, and if we click over to the examples, we can move over to the next one. 
So, oh, this is a good one. <laughs> this sentence about shortening it down, how to, how to shorten it down and how to, you know, um, we can get quite clever when we're talking about art. We start talking about all these, you know, the notions of exploring the notions of gender and everything instead of just saying the art is about gender. Because if you've only got 500 characters uh, to explore that or investigating ideas, concepts and notions of race becomes they investigate race. Um, you need to practice not using vague words and being very specific. So having to actually distill your biography down to 500 characters is actually a very good exercise for you to do anyway, even if you're not planning to um, join this award at this time, in, it's great to have a short, short version of your bio ready on hand. So when you're trying to be uh, explain your art in technical terms and in symbolic terms and in um, trying to explain your idea fully. We can get too waffly and we can get too uh, long in all this. So learning and practicing how to shorten your words is something that's very, very important to do. So let's go and have a look at some of the examples on the next slide. Hi, Rochelle. Nice to I see your, your name just popped up on the chat. Um, I just grabbed this from Rochelle's uh, website. And this is a great straightforward um, uh, bio from her website. But if you have a look, it's still 972 characters with spaces. So it's, it's really still too long. I've taken a, from another person I know, Sue Leeming, uh, her bio there. I, that is taken from a much longer bio, which was probably about 500 words, I think. So I just took out the first two paragraphs and that is 742 characters with spaces. So it's, as you can see, you can't waste time and you have to select details very, very carefully in order to get down to that 500 characters with spaces. So if your bio has, has got down to a length like these two examples, then you still have to get your highlighter out and go through and absolutely highlight what are the essentials. Cross out words, figure out how to say something in a shorter way, Use the key words that are going to be very important for um, SEO on your website as well. Um, and just keep on working to distill your bio story. I call a bio story, your, your story of you as an artist. Distill, distill, distill. So at the end of this, when you, if you are applying for the award, have a look at some of the examples that are um, on the website from last year's competition. I think later on I've got I've got a slide somewhere of one that we took from the Mandela uh, website um, for the artist statement. So the process is the same for the artist statement and the bio in the sense of the content, but the process. You're taking this great big subject matter of you as an artist or your art and distilling and distilling and distilling and distilling until you get it short enough to meet the requirements that have been asked of you. So when you go back, um, before we move on to the statements, if, when you're writing your bio, go back through these notes that I've given you and actually answer the questions, write the statements. And by the end of it, try and come up with a bio that might be four or 500 words long, one that's 200 words long, one that's around 120 words long. And the 120 word one should, depending on the length of your words, of course, um, fit that uh, requirement for the 500 characters, including spaces. So I hope 
hope that makes sense. And if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat and we will answer them at the end. Or if we run out of time, we're very happy to um, email answers as well if you have anything specific. So let's go on to artist statements. An artist statement is not about you, the artist. Um, it's about your work, the art. Um, so there's a distinction there um, about that um, in terms of what, what is it about. It, in the Mandela Art Award, it is about your particular art piece. And this is where we tie into what Angela was saying earlier about your about symbolism and um and metaphor as well because that'll definitely come into why you make your art the artist statement is about what you make and why you make it it should experience add to the experience of viewing your art i think we've all had an, a, an experience of going to a gallery and looking at a piece of of art and you can see one of sue leeming's pieces in in the background here um i see sue has joined and I've got very fortunate to have one of her pieces in my study um, and when I hear Sue's story about her um, Maori background in New Zealand and her mountain Taranaki and her her journey her, her the symbolism that she puts into her work and the story that makes that piece of art come alive for me and that is what you're trying to do in either writing out your artist's your artwork as a whole or if you're writing to uh, to apply for an award such as this award we've all had that experience of doing a piece of art when you understand it more because of the story behind it it makes it so much more meaningful so what do you then need to think about with your Art. So again, it's the same process. I would get make yourself the discipline of writing, even if you're not a writer, even if you hate writing about your art. As an artist, you have to write about your art at some point of time in your life, whether it's for a catalogue, a an exhibition, or an, a competition such as this. I would go through and actually write a few sentences, one or two sentences about all of this and try and get something across that's more personal, not just a clinical, technical description of your art, but try and bring in something of a story. What inspires you to create your art? What is the story behind your art? What is and this is where your bio informs your artist statement because in the bio, hopefully you've captured something about you as the person, as the artist, and what you, what inspires you. And then how does that cross over into your work? Is your work obviously an extension of yourself and your ideas and your inspiration and trying to be personal about it, especially when you're limited to 500 characters is very difficult, but you must show something of yourself not just tell us about the technical aspects of your work but show us something imagine if someone came to your um your viewing of or your exhibition and they weren't a sighted person now i know someone who, who does this and they go around and they have either have someone read the captions to them or some exhibitions actually have some audio obviously that they can uh, connect into if someone couldn't actually see your art does your description give them a visual you must create a visual in your description not just for people who are, are, don't have sight or have difficulty but I think when when the judges of a competition are reading your uh, bio and your artist statement Gonna, they're going to look for something that's going to give them another depth to looking at your art, a, a bit more depth and a bit more understanding and a bit more um, inspiration. So I think 
you know, doing all these exercises actually informs your art yourself and it helps you to think about your art and why you create it and, and all that sort of thing. So once you, I won't go through all those questions because you will be getting those, but write a couple of sentences and think about the issues and the topics and the culture and the idea that other people can relate to. What are the meta ideas that, are, that apply to humanity, to all of us as people? Something that you know, people can relate to generally. And when we're talking about faith, whether it's a Christian faith or another faith of, of a different sort, even if someone comes who's, see, if this is a Christian art competition, but what does it say about humanity about faith about belief about whatever that can apply to anybody who looks at your art and I think connecting with people is very important it's not a manifesto and it's not an art lecture and it's it's not just a series of adjectives or a big theory it's actually about your work and what the process is what is the what informs your art the concepts uh, uh, relationships um, and you need to think about your audience. Who is this for? And have different versions for different contexts. So for the context of the Mandela Award, you'll be writing about one piece of art. But if you're writing um, for a general, your blog or your um, an, 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 an exhibition of a lot of your work, it's great to be able to have a statement that um, addresses the big, a picture of your art, the meta picture of your art as well. So write these things down. Have a have a four hundred word version. Have a two hundred word version. Have a hundred and twenty word version. Distill it down. It's much easier to start with the longer, cut, distill, edit, right down to the bottom bit till you get to your elevator pitch. It's really about your personal reasons and motivations about why you create your art, and what you create and the techniques, anything that's special about your art and the meaning of your art. So what is the content? I think we've got this, yeah, great. So what? You can ask yourself, what's the content? You know, what is it? It's what medium is it? Is it paint? Is it sculpture? Is it installation, photography, whatever? Why do you do it? What excites you about this work? What, ex what is the ideas, the inspirations behind it? And describe how you did it if, you, if you've got space. Try to think of things that are unique to you and try and make it sound like you. Read it aloud. Listen as if you're an observer. Like listen to the, your own description. I, I would um, play it on my phone on my dictaphone or whatever record it play it back and listen to it and think oh that sounds rather good about yourself um, because we don't often reflect when we write I think if we listen to what we've written it actually helps you and shorter is better so 100 to 300 words in length distill it down and distill it down if you had one minute to talk to the judges about the piece of art that you are um, putting into the exhibition, uh, the competition, the art award, what would you say? And so for some people, it's easier to say it than write it. So if you are one of those people, I would suggest, again, instead of writing first, just talk it out. Talk it out with a friend, talk it out with someone else, or just talk to yourself and record it play it back and then take notes from what you've said for those people who really don't like putting pen to paper that's a really good tip i i've i know people who've written whole books doing that they've they've just talked it through had it transcribed and then edited into a a book form so why not do that for even your artist statements no matter how long or short they are we do have a couple of examples uh, here and um, from the Mandola Art Prize and other, other things. And we've got a whole lot of practical tips as well. I won't read them all to you, but um, because we're, we're sort of 
running short on time, I'm going to be uh, conscious of that. But if you have a look at some of the, the difference, this silkscreen artist one, I think he's quite creative and a little bit different. And it, it depends on the context and, you know, different competitions, different contexts, whether they're sometimes if they're more academic context, if it's a more avant-garde context, you can craft your um, bio and art statement to actually fit the context. So that's why I think it's valuable for you to spend time and actually have several versions of your thing um, and, um, and actually um, have those on hand for you. This one I find it's more this one's really conversation you know what are, what am I trying to say with my art um, you know I like it when a place has been around long enough that there is a kind of tension between the way it was the original design book and the way it looks now as well as the tension between the way it looks to whoever is caring for it and the way it looks to me now to me that's a little bit wordy but I like the ideas in it um, the trouble is the kind of places I find most appealing keep getting closed down or torn down. What do I want to say with my art? So this one is really conversational and it might be very helpful uh, to you to, um, to have a play with something a little bit more creative. Uh, the next one is probably a little bit more um, straightforward but it's still in that first person and it's still thoughtful. Um, unfinished inventories of fragments. You know, um, I like the sound of this art. I haven't seen the art, but when I read it, I, I'm intrigued um, and I want to see what, what the person is thinking about. Um, this is perhaps something that you could do too. Read through some artist statements of other people and actually get some good ideas and think and have a play. I think to see it as a work of art, see your bio and your artist statement as a work of art and have a play with it and enjoy doing it. Now, the next part of the, the um, oh, that's one I got off the website from the Mandela, Mandela um, website as well. We just click through. You can read those later because you will receive those. I just did a whole lot of tips that I would give to any writer, really, um, but also try to choose the tips specifically for the biography and artist statements. So let's just quickly skim through them because we haven't got time to go through them in detail but you will be able to get the copy and read it later. So change the tone for different contexts. That's what I was just saying before about try to be a bit more creative or a bit more avant-garde. And then um, for some context, another might be more academic and, and serious. Um, use right quotes from your writing or your interviews for your content. I would definitely read it aloud and, and record it and play it back. Or you, if you use text speech in the word, in word, you can actually just get it to read it back to you in a, in a very mechanical voice and listen for interesting ideas or statements and, and do it. Some of you might use word ability statistics. If you don't know what they are, I can write about that in the comments later on. Or if someone wants to know, I can email that answer to you. Try not to be, use hyperbole and, you know, I am one of the most important artists of our time. Well, you know, try not to overrate yourself unless you actually are or someone else has said that about you. Um, don't use jargon or art speak overly unless it's necessary. And if you're limited to 500 characters with, with spaces, you're not going to be able to use a lot of long words anyway. So use carefully, make it natural as part of a sentence and don't just pile on the technical artistic terms just to sound uh, more important or something. Make sure it does actually relate directly to your, um, your practice, your art practice. 
Now, there's all sorts of things like practical things like spelling and punctuation. I think we used uh, also the uh, fewer words and I've got the examples there about gender, shortening the sentences. Edit ruthlessly, have a critique partner, find someone, maybe someone else on this chat. Um, let's partner up, let's help each other with our bios and our, our um, statements. Let's read them and give each other feedback and, and help each other. Um, make sure that if it's for your blog, use the SEO. Okay, so we've come to the end of my part and we've got a, a few minutes for questions um, so you will receive those all those slides so if you have any follow-up questions please ask them now or email us thank you very much thanks very much Elaine that was wonderful and uh, there's a lot of material there for everybody to explore Already on the chat somebody has asked um, more about the readability stats too so perhaps you could um, reply at length and then we can publish that. We can send that out to all of the participants in this. We did have a question from Jenny uh, here in Western Australia about the um, symbolism and metaphor um, question. And she was asking, uh, does Mandela have specific ideas that one has to follow? And no, we don't. What is in the terms and conditions is is as specific as we get. So it's how you as an artist um, interpret with the use of either a single metaphor or with um, a rich symbolism and layers of symbolism. Um, so Mandela does not lay down uh, strictures about which way you have to go. The, the most important thing, of course, is to address the theme. And our theme this time is metamorphosis. And of course, that a beautiful quote from the prophet Isaiah about seeing something new. Uh, do you perceive it? Can you see that something that is new? Um, and so um, uh, any other questions? What if we got there, Mandy? Hey guys, welcome. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, if anyone of you have any more questions, please jot them down in the chat. Um, everyone's saying it was very informative. Thank you so much, Elaine. A wonderful presentation. So got some great feedback. We'll just wait a few minutes um, for any more questions. Thank you so much, guys. going to take the opportunity to thank Mandy too because she's worked incredibly hard to bring this together technically and none of us are pretending that we're experts but we're very grateful Mandy for your expertise so well done no questions I don't see any questions here so um yeah So someone saying really helpful. Thank you, Elaine and Angela. Awesome. Well, I think that is it. Um, if you have any um, questions regarding your artworks, um, please um, email your um, inquiries to Lynn. Um, Lynn, would you like to share your email? Um, Uh, sure, Mandy. Um, I'll just type my um, my email address in the uh, chat box. That's great. Um, you'll see uh, Lynn's email address in the chat if you would like to get in contact with her regarding any um, inquiries regarding your artwork. 
size. Um, but yeah, if you guys don't have any questions, we um, would just like to say thank you for joining us today. It was lovely to have so many people join us. We know and we hope that this was informative for you. And we would just like to say thank you, Elaine. Thank you for joining us again. Um, it was really great information. I thoroughly enjoy that myself. So um, Angela, would you like to say goodbye to everyone? <laughs> yes, thank you all for joining us. And thank you to our wonderful committee who worked so hard to make these things happen. Um, should you wish to see further webinars, um, I think it's something, a direction that we could very well go. So let us know what you need and let us know what we can do to help you. So thank you for being participants. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Elaine. Um, thank you, Lynn. And thank you to all those who participated.